Welcome to another moment in the Word. We're now coming to a subject we don't often talk about, and that's the subject of fasting. What is a fast? And when was the last time you fasted? And is fasting necessary? And if so, what does it accomplish? And who is it for? Well, these are the questions that we're going to try to address, but our Lord addresses it in Matthew chapter 6. He's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and he has just given us a model prayer and told us that we need to forgive one another. And now he says this, moreover, this is in verse 16, we'll be meditating down to verse 18. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that you may appear not unto men to fast, but unto your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is in secret shall reward you openly. So he begins by saying, moreover, it's day in the Greek, it's a conjunction, it's connecting with forgiving, forgiving others because you are forgiven. And if you're not forgiving others, then that's an indication you don't understand what mercy is and how great that mercy is. Jesus has been talking in this whole section in chapter 6 about three different ways in which Jewish people express their worship to God, first in alms. And he has been saying that if you are charitable, if you are giving some contribution to others, then your gift of love, that's why it's called charity, your gift of love is to be done in secret so that your heavenly Father who sees in secret rewards you. And then you're to pray. But your prayer is not to be seen of men. It's not to be on street corners where men will look at you or long prayers or prayers that have great erudition and sound eloquence. Instead, what he says that you're to pray to your father. You're not praying to people to be heard. And now he comes to fasting. And you'll find oftentimes that fasting and prayer, they go together. But which is it? Is it fasting that is first or prayer? Well, oftentimes, actually, it is fasting. There's a circumstance in your life that has caused you to stop eating. And that's literally what the Greek word means. The Greek word means to abstain from eating. But the Hebrew word, I like this. And the Hebrew word means to withhold natural food, foods from the body so that the spirit might then res- be received in the soul. But it is also, and this is the word, ina nefesh. Nefesh is the word for soul. And in the ina means an affliction of the soul. Something has happened in your life that has caused you to be so afflicted. It could be grief. It could be the death of someone in your life that has caused you to say, I'm not interested in eating. I need to be alone. I need to talk to God. And that's what this word means. It has the idea that David talked about in Psalm 35, 13. I humbled, I afflicted my soul with fasting. The fasting is a way of depriving the body so that the soul is receptive to the Spirit of God, to Him talking to you. David said this in Psalm 69 and verse 10, When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach, I made sackcloth also as my garment. In other words, there was an awareness of sin. There was an awareness that something is going on in my life that I must repent of. And that repentance causes me to say, this body, which I will someday put off anyhow, must be now laid aside in the concerns of the body in order that I might now approach God. It is the preparation of the soul in prayer. Sometimes 
It is also prayer and fasting. And that is sometimes your prayers will bring you to a greater awareness. And God has spoken to you through your prayers and through his word that results in you saying, I don't want to eat. Now you'll find that prayer is mentioned many, many times in the Bible, and there's various people that pray. For instance, you have Ezra. Ezra was a priest. Ezra leaves now Persia, and he has been given a decree from uh, the king that he now can return back to Jerusalem. And he was given safety, and as a result, he calls on the people to fast and to pray. It's interesting, Ezra is a priest, when he returns to Jerusalem, and there is a celebration. It's Thanksgiving that has caused him to fast and to pray. But what does he do? He rebuilds the temple. Then you have Nehemiah that follows. He then comes back from Babylon, and he also comes back, and he has been given permission. He has been given provision by the king. As a result, he also fasts and prays. But notice the order here. It is first the rebuilding of the temple. Our worship must be made right before our national security can be secured. As you think of the situation in which we find ourselves in the world today, there is good cause for us to fast and to pray. We find that when there was a national emergency, Esther Esther in chapter 4 and verse 16, she calls on the whole nation for three days to fast and to pray as she goes to her husband, Ahasuerus, who's the king, to plead with him with regard to the salvation of the Jewish people. When there is a concern of great eminence for you and for the church, for the world at large, then it causes us to pray And as a result, it may cause you to lay everything else aside to say, I am not giving myself to food. In fact, what I would normally be giving myself to with the normal exercises and routines and schedules of my life, everything has been cleared because there is one thing that is absolutely a concern. And it may be sin in your life or it may be sin in the world. And as we now think, many, many believers around the world have begun Lent, a 40-day period of some affliction of the soul in preparation for that time in which Jesus will be dying on the cross. Now, Jesus died 2,000 years ago, but we reflect on that in that period called Lent. Or else it may be the circumstances which are going on right now in the Ukraine and in Eastern Europe. And it may be that you now are of great concern. Please notice, that is not just simply where you watch the TV and become inundated with the news, but that that causes you to pray. And that prayer is so great and so impressive to you that you now give yourself to fasting and prayer. There was only one true time in which the, the, the Israelites were called upon to pray. And that is Yom Kippur. That was the day in which there was an awareness of sin, and they were to remember their sin, and the sin personally, but also the sin nationally. And that that was to be reserved, not only remembered, but it was also where the nation called themselves in fasting and in prayer before God for his mercy. And we should be praying that today and praying with a similar kind of concern. But I want you to notice that Jesus does not call us to fast. He says, moreover, when you fast... Well, we find in the New Testament, there was Anna that fasted and prayed. She was in the temple and she was continuing to fast and pray in preparation for the one who would be born, Messiah. There was Simeon who gave himself to fasting and prayer. Our Lord, when he went into the wilderness to be led by the Holy Spirit, to be tested by Satan, gave himself in fasting and prayer. And that is because he is the God-man. And as man... 
he also, like you and me, have a body that we're in, but he deprived the body so that he might hear from the Father and might have victory over Satan. If that is true of our Lord, how much more it's true of us in the spiritual warfare we find ourselves in. And we find the early church, when they had the appointment, the replacement for Judas by Matthias, they fasted and prayed. Paul, when he was seeking the Lord's direction, fasted and prayed. It is important that we, on occasion, fast and pray. But our Lord now is giving us also direction as to how we fast and pray. And that is, when you fast, and the you is plural, that is the body of Christ, Sometimes it would be appropriate for a church leader or a pastor, an elder, or a, 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 an evangelist to call for prayer. There's nothing wrong with that. Or it may be that you personally are fasting and praying, but that you're not as a hypocrite. A hypocrite is a two-faced person who may be laughing on the inside, but appearing to be sad on the outside, appearing to be fasting, appearing to have ash and sackcloth on them, but inside they're pious, inside they're proud. And then Jesus says, they have a sad, sad countenance, they disfigure their faces, they put shadow under their eyes so it looks recessed and it looks like they've been fasting, that they may appear unto men to fast. Well, now that's not the purpose of fasting. Fasting is an expression of the heart, of the soul, and that's what Jesus is continually bringing us back to, that if you're giving, you're giving out of your heart, and you're giving because the Lord gave all for you. If you're praying, you're talking to God. You're not talking to people. If you're forgiving, you're forgiving because of what God has done for you. And if you're fasting, you're not fasting to impress people. You're fasting in order that your prayers might be concentrated and focused on the issue that you're praying for before God. If you're fasting, don't tell people you're fasting. Don't say, well, I'm going to be fasting for 40 days. That is not the issue here. Jesus is saying that if you're like the hypocrites, that they cover their faces or they make their faces look like they're fasting, then you have your reward already. Your ostentatious behavior causes then others to say, oh, how holy you are, how pious, how religious you are, when in fact... Jesus says they already have their reward. Verse 17, but you, and now again, it's plural. You, when you fast, you anoint your head. The anointing has the idea of oil. In other words, make it shine, make it bright. In other words, look normal, look even the opposite so that men would not know that you're fasting because it's not about what other people think. It's about what God thinks. It's about your own heart. If it's broken, it's not important what people know that it's broken about. It's important that you have from God the answer that you've been praying for. And so he says, when you fast, that you fast in such a way that you appear not to men to fast, but verse 18, unto your Father who's in secret. You know, he knows what you're praying, and you don't have to pray out loud. He knows your thoughts. Satan doesn't know your thoughts, but God does. God knows your heart, and he's looking for truth in the inner parts of your heart. He wants to know, is there that desire within you? When you pray, his name be holy, that in fact, you're praying your heart is holy, and that when you're praying his kingdom come, that you look at what's going on in the world today, and you say, oh Lord, it is clear this is the working of Satan that brings murder and destruction and death into the world. We're praying for his kingdom, and if your heart's broken for what is going on in the world, what you hear and see on the news, then that ought to call us to prayer and to fasting. 
And so consequently, he says that your father who is in secret, he rewards you openly. Now, how does he reward you openly? Does he let everybody know, oh, you were fasting in prayer? No, you have answered a prayer. You can see in your life answers that not only can be explained in God terms, in ways in which it is clear, God has answered, and he answers openly. He answers physically. He answers in a way that your daily bread comes, that forgiveness comes, that changes take place in people's lives, that there is a repentance. I'm reminded of the story of Jonah. Jonah, in chapter 3, goes to Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital of Syria. And Nineveh is a great country, one of the greatest powers of that time. And he goes, and as you know, Jonah didn't want to go and to give the message of God's mercy. Instead, he wants to go the other way. He's in a great fish for three days and three nights and then has to travel about 120 miles inland to the place, the capital, Nineveh. Well, you can imagine being in the belly of a great fish for three days and three nights, and the acids of the, of the intestines and the body, the belly of that great fish, eating away, causing his complexion to look white and ashen, to cause his clothes to look tattered, and then walking through a desert area to go to the capital. And he goes to the king, and he says to the king, just four words in Hebrew, and it is 40 days and then judgment. Well, I would imagine that the king would see Jonah, and the result would be if you are one of God's prophets, and this is what he does to his own people, to his own choice vessels, then we don't have a chance. And so what happens? After Jonah gives that report, it says, so the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth and greatness from the greatest of them unto the least. And the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and he covered himself with sackcloth and ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd or flock taste anything. In other words, a fast. Let them neither feed nor drink water. And they cried out mightily unto the Lord. And what happened? What God does and we do in secret, he publishes openly. God spared the city of Nineveh for 40 years, a whole generation. We're in troubling times, but it is a time for prayer. This nation, whatever nation you're in, needs God more than we need anything else. And if you're a child of God, you're a leader, I pray that you're calling on our God who does mightily and that you may be called to fast in your prayers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, for the conviction of it. And for the fact, Father, that you do hear prayers. And that when we ask, you hear. When we seek, we find. And when we knock, it is opened unto us. That our hearts, Father, tremble before you. Our hearts are broken and contrite. We seek peace, your kingdom to come. Now, Father, we also pray, if there's any that do not know the Lord Jesus that they might repent of sin and recognize that Jesus alone and his blood can cleanse of sin and be saved. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.